just what is the false prophecy that Christ is already here, that he's already come, and he's in the deserts, also known as wilderness, and the secret places. This is part 21 of the Olivet Discourse. We've been working on a series of YouTube videos about the Olivet Discourse. This was a discourse when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives during the Passion Week. He spoke it to his disciples. The prophecy had to do with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Not one stone would be left upon another. The disciples, of course, had two questions. When will these temples buildings be destroyed? And secondly, what is the sign of the end of the world and the second coming? So the whole Olivet Discourse in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, it had all together to do with which is known as the Great Tribulation. It's the time period of intense tribulation on the church prior to the second coming of Christ, and then also the last day in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Please consider subscribing to this channel. There's a little red button in the bottom right-hand corner. Just a quick review about prophecy in the Bible. It's relatively simple. The order of events are that we're currently in the church age, which has gone on for some 2,000 years. There's a period of apostasy near the end of this period, which I do believe we're in now. That ushers in the Great Tribulation, which is a little season. It's a Great Tribulation on the nominal Christian church. It features false Christ, false prophets, which we're going to look at in this video, the Antichrist, abomination of desolation, etc. Then comes the last day. It's, it's the general resurrection of the dead. The saved are resurrected to eternal life, the unsaved to judgment. It's the second coming of Jesus Christ, and that brings in eternity and the new heavens and the new earth. Now, in the Olivet Discourse, we find three warnings about three different types of of false prophecies. We looked in the last video about the time draws near, otherwise known as the time is at hand, and we saw how it relates to the pre-tribulational rapture false prophecy. We're going to look in this video about the Christ is already here, and we're going to look specifically at existential living for today, or churches that teach that all that matters is your life today, and or prophecy also is not taught or not important. Next video, we'll look at all the signs and wonders, so we're going to look at that. But for now, let's get into this thing about the Christ is already here. Here are the passages, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17. For then shall be great tribulation. A couple verses later, then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. And when that uh, phrase there, here is Christ, is in the present tense, so someone will come to you saying, Christ is already here. And in other words, all you need is Christ today. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and this is exactly what the false Christ and false prophets teach, that Christ is essentially already here today. You don't have to worry about future prophecy. Behold, I've told you before. Jesus has told us this over and over in the, in the scriptures. We're going to look at a slide on that. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Really, it's wilderness. Go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. So we're going to dig into the meaning of these secret chambers and the wilderness. And we're going to look at that in this video. Just a quick review on false Christ and false prophets. We've done videos on that already. They are in the Great Tribulation, and even today, we've always had false prophets and false Christ. They're going to show great signs and wonders, and it's all about, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, the chosen of God, God's people. False Christ are leaders in the church. They have a lot of power. They may be online. They may be, may be on YouTube. They may be in your churches, your mega churches, on TV, wherever, but they end up deceiving they're false prophets in that they deceive with false teaching. They're false priests. They have a false gospel, a false way to salvation like the free will gospel. They're false kings. They're false leaders. False prophets are just a subset of that. It's deceivers. But a false Christ has all three of the, the items about false prophecy, false ways of salvation, and false leaders. And there's also false prophets, and they're going to abound. There's many of them in the Great Tribulation. Now, anybody that teaches that all that matters is Christ is here today, 
They discount prophecy. They say he's already here. All you have to worry about is your relationship with Christ now and your prayer life with him now. That's just not true because when Christ returns, it's a great, wonderful event for us. We see in Matthew 24, also Luke 17, that right after the verse we're studying, he is in the desert or wilderness. Go not forth, behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall com the coming of the Son of Man be. We will know the return of Christ, and it's something glorious. It's much more glorious than our, our present life in this world. That's our blessed hope. That's what we look forward to. So it's obvious that, that this idea about just focus on now is, is, a, is not the right way to teach at all in the Bible. Okay, Jesus tells us that he's told us this before. He's already told us Jesus, of course, is the prophet. It's by the Spirit of Christ that all the Old Testament prophets spoke. The whole Bible is inspired by the Spirit of Christ. Prophecy is important. It's largely discussed in the Bible, looking forward of things to come. The Old Testament prophets, a lot of that was all about what happened in Jerusalem, but it always looked to a future day of regathering, a future day of salvation. And also all those things that happened then were examples for us. The Babylonian captivity, it covers a large portion of the Old Testament, yet the Babylonian captivity is a symbol for the Great Tribulation, which we're about to enter. The Olivet Discourse, the whole book of Revelation, First and Second Thessalonians, there's much prophecy that's been written by the Spirit of Christ in the Bible. Okay, so now let's dig in to this thing about Christ in the desert, or also known as the word for wilderness, and it's good, we're going to see that what it's talking about, and we see this all the time in churches today and online and TV, it's all about the priority of the Christian life on earth. So Matthew 24, 26, Wherefore, if they say to you, these are the people in the church, the false Christ, the false prophets, they're going to say, Behold, he is in the desert, he's in the wilderness. They're going to say, You're in the wilderness, this is your Christian experience, this is your life, he's right there with you. And they don't talk about prophecy. They don't talk about a better day coming. They're saying he's right there with you in that, in that wilderness experience. And, or he's in a secret changer. Believe it not. Believe it not. Now that word wilderness there, we're going to go through a couple slides here, a few slides, that it represents the place of the Christian life here on earth. It's where we're sojourning as pilgrims and strangers on this earth. It's not our goal. Our goal is to be with Christ in heaven and to keep our minds set on things above. The wilderness, we're going to see, it has all to do together with our being humble. We're proved by God that we're faithful to him. We serve him. We serve other people. We're faithful under persecution. So this thing about Christ in the wilderness, it's when the church focus is on the Christian life on earth and not on future glory. We see many examples in the Bible where the wilderness represents it's a place of, of being proved and tested and nourished. Jesus was proved. He was tempted by the devil. Matthew 4, Israel was the church in the wilderness. They were proved and tested if they're going to serve God. And by and large, they failed that. There was obviously faithful people. God's people were there. But, but most of Israel did not prove to be faithful. It's a type of the Christian life, the wilderness experience. We're going to look at a slide coming up that the woman in Revelation 12, it's the church in the wilderness. The woman represents the church, is persecuted, proved, and nourished in her place. Okay, we see, let's just take a look at Israel quickly, Deuteronomy 8, 2, just to get this thing about wilderness solid in our mind. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. And by the way, that number 40 is the number of proving, it's the number of trial. It's used many times in the Bible to reflect that. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, as we recall. So Israel was 40 years in the wilderness to humble them, to make them humble, to, to know that they needed to rely on God. They needed food, and they needed guidance, and they needed leadership through the wilderness and safety. And to prove thee, 
to test them to see what was in their heart, whether thou would keep his commandments or no. And generally they failed. Okay, Revelation 12, the woman, the church, and the wilderness. We read in Revelation 12, and we've done a whole study on the book of Revelation. I'll tag this slide with a video we've done on the woman in the wilderness. She fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God. This wilderness experience is a, is a testing of us. It's not the goal of our life is to be with Christ in eternity. This is a trial for us here. It's not where, this is not the only thing that matters. That they should feed her 1260 days. 1260 is a symbolic number for the time of the church age. But we see the dragon persecuted the woman he brought, <clears throat> who brought forth the man-child, Jesus Christ, because Christ was born in the flesh body. He, in a sense, was born from the church, Mary, his mother, to whom the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. The wilderness, it's a place that God has given to us where we are nourished by God. We also see, and we have to remember, that yes, we are in a wilderness experience, but we desire a better heavenly country. Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, but now they desire a better country, just like us today. We don't want to be satisfied with the church teaching us that all that matters is your experience in this world, your existence, your existential life, Christ is already there with you. He's already come in that regard. He's come for you and he guides you in the wilderness. <clears throat> no, there's a future day where Christ returns in all his glory. But we desire a better country, a heavenly one, where God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That's New Jerusalem, Revelation 21. And again, we've done a study on that as well in Revelation. We see in the same chapter, Hebrews 11, they wandered in deserts, and that word desert, there is the wilderness, it's the same word. In the mountains, dens, caves, all these things haven't obtained a good report through faith, because that's what faith is about. It's our hoping for the future. It's the assurance of things hoped for. It's a testing area. It's, it's a place that we're proved by God. Okay, so God's people are to focus on the future to focus on future. Yes, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit that's leading us through this Christian life, but we want to be present with Christ because that's what we desire. When people teach that only thing you have in this world is Christ is with you right now. Don't worry. You have your prayer life and your wilderness experience, and they don't teach prophecy. They're essentially saying, here is the Christ. He's right there with you. In a sense, that's true because we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but it's only a down payment. It's the earnest of our inheritance of the glory of eternal life. Note 1 Corinthians 15. If in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Our, our Christ is, is, we're looking for that future day. 1 John 3. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, when Christ returns at the second coming, he hasn't returned yet. That second coming hasn't happened. We shall be like him, and every man that has his hope in him purifies himself. And we see that word hope again, because faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And more than that, we look for and hasten. That word hasten means to eagerly await the coming of the day of God. We, 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 we don't er eagerly wait in this world. We're eagerly waiting for the, the, the Christ to return and the ushering in of the new heavens and the earth, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Because that day, the coming of God, will usher in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what our focus is to be on. It's not saying that all we have is Christ here with us today. Let's look at the other thing. We looked at the wilderness, that people will say, well, you're in the wilderness. Christ is already with you. He's already come for you. But they also emphasize this thing about the secret places. And we're going to look at what that means in the uh, few slides that follow here. Okay, God is in the secret chambers. When we look at that word secret chambers, that two words, it's really one Greek word, tamion. And it means a small private room. It only occurs four times in the New Testament. A small private room. And very notably, it's used in Matthew 6.6. 6. But thou, when you pray, enter into thy closet. There's that word Greek, tamion, closet. When thou hast shut the door, pray to your Father, which is in secret. 
It's our hiding place. It's our secret place where we commune. We pray to God and we learn from God. We, we, that's in a secret place where our life is hidden with Christ. And thy father would seize in secret to reward thee openly. So we see, though, that in Matthew 24, 26, that they're going to say he's in those secret places. And in a sense, that's true because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit and we can pray to the Father. And we're warned in the Bible that, that we don't pray to Christ. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. But, but, that, but we, we don't have that yet. We still await that beautiful heavenly country. We also see in the Old Testament about this hiding place or this secret place because in this world we will have tribulation and we, in a sense, we're hid with God. And we go through this proving or this wilderness experience and during the great tribulation there'll be a lot of persecution. Note Isaiah 26. Come, my people, it's addressed to God's people, enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself as it were for a little moment unto the indignation or judgment day be overpassed. Psalm 119, God is our hiding place. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Through the word of God, we know that we have the assurance of salvation because faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's a, it's a secret place, but that doesn't mean that Christ has come already. And some people overemphasize our wilderness experience and that all we need is that we're, we're in this hiding place. We, we can't ignore the truth that we're still waiting for that better day. These secret places, therefore, represent this personal relationship with God in this life. And that's what is very much emphasized in churches today. It's all about you have a personal relationship. All you need is God today. And in a sense, again, that's true. But we, we hope for a much more glorious day. In other passages in the Old Testament, we're not going to go through these in detail, but all of them point to the, the, the life in this world. We see Psalm 27, we, we hide in a, the pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. Psalm 31, the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. I abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. It's a hiding place. It's a place of safety. And it's secret and safe. We have this wonderful experience in this life. But it's not all. We still wait for that future day. Okay, so we see now that the focus of the church today, now we're going to look at the church today a little bit more. It's all about the life in this world now. Rarely, rarely, rarely do you hear any church preach anything about prophecy. They want to avoid the topic. And, and when they do teach it, it's mostly false prophecy. So mostly churches don't teach end-time prophecy. So in a sense, by doing that, they're saying, Christ is here today, and he's all you need, and you have him already here today. A parallel passage to the Olivet Discourse, which is saying Christ is already here. It's all you need. He's already here. We see that parallel passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The, the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we've looked at in many other videos, is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. It's the last day. It's the second coming of Christ. It's also judgment day. But it's a day that we receive the salvation of our souls and our glorified spiritual body. And the warning in 2 Thessalonians this is the same as the Olivet Discourse. Don't be soon shaken. Don't be troubled that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For there must come a falling away, which is the, is the apostasy, and the man of sin, which is the Antichrist, be revealed. And the man of sin is revealed during the Great Tribulation. But it says that the day of Christ is at hand. And when it says is at hand means literally is standing already. When we look at this phrase, the day of Christ at hand, first of all, the Young's Literal Translation does a better job translating this. But really the error of 2 Thessalonians 2 and the deception that was done in the, uh, in the Thessal Thessalonica had all together to do that said the day of Christ had already come. It's no different than what's being taught in the churches today. Don't worry about prophecy. It's not that important. All you need is your prayer life and your Christian experience. That's all you need. Christ is already here. He's already with you. 
But but and that was the error in Second Thessalonians two. We see again in verse two and three, as the day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you. Deceive you. And this this is it, the the verb here at hand, it has to do with it's standing. It's the perfect tense, active tense that he's already there, he's already arrived. Okay, so the church focus is living for now. And we see all type of things in the church. It's like self-help, it's church counseling. You have a, a sermon that's one verse and then the pastor goes on and on and on about all his personal life experiences, anecdotal stories about people in the church or things that happen in the media or the TV or wherever on the internet. All these stories about it that can help you, help you. It's all about application. They'll use the word, well, we want to make sure the scripture applies to you. And somehow you'll get some type of moral relief, some type of guidance on how to live a better life. That's not what the Bible is about. The Bible is a beautiful, mystical book that works in us. When we hear the word of God speaking to us, it will change our life. But a big part of that word of God is prophecy. We see in John 7, for example, he that speaks of himself seeks his own glory. That's what most pastors and teachers do today. They speak of themselves. They have one verse, then they go off on all these tangents about their own life's experience and everything else. Just teach the Bible, verse by verse, passage by passage, and, and seek the glory of God. 2 Thessalonians 1.10, when we shall come to be glorified, we eagerly await for that day to be glorified, where God is glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all that believe him in that day. That's what we should be doing, is looking forward. It's not living for the present. It's not this existential nonsense, this self-help type of, of teaching. That's not what the church should be focusing on. A couple of verses, we already looked at 1 Corinthians 15. If in this life we only have hope, we are most men miserable. We're not promised all these wonderful riches and everything else in this world. We wait for the next world where we have glorified and beautiful riches. We see Demas has forsaken Paul, having loved his present life. When we have hope only in this life and we only focus on this life, we love this world. We love our present situation. It's a scary thing to ask people, are you really looking forward to the coming of Christ? Or are there things in your life now that you're excited about? You can't wait to get this thing or that thing or watch somebody graduate or whatever it may be. Our, our glory should be in the next world. It should be, we shouldn't care about the riches and the cares and the pleasures of this life. Okay, and other people, out and out scoff at the return of Christ. They reject prophecy. They don't want to hear it. No different than the false teachers that we find in the book of Jude and the book of 2 Peter. You, it's In 2 Peter, there will be scoffers walking after their own lust. They don't want to think about the future. They want to think about their lust in this world now. And they say, where's the promise of his coming? He's already here. That's what they'll tell you. All you have to worry about is your day today. You want to you want to reach your destiny. You achieve all your goals in this life. We, we also see the Jude 17, the words which are spoken by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there'll be mockers in the last time because they walk after ungodly lust. They love this world so much. Okay, but we look for the blessed hope, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. All the things that happen in this world to us are done to prove us and to try us and to humble us and to teach us. And it's not about what we achieve in this world that's important. It's what we have in glory in eternity. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we remember that we have Christ is in you, the hope of glory, because Christ lives in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and we have this future assurance of glory. Also, Christians must be watchful. We are looking for the future. Now, we're going to have some parables coming up that will be part of this series 
But just a foretaste of that, Matthew 24, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, finds so doing. We serve God in this world. We don't chase our ungodly lust and our abilities and our, our, our promotions and all that stuff. No, we, we're, we're humbly servant in this wilderness experience. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord comes. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches. We should always be watching. We keep our gardens, garments, we keep them spot free, the best we can in the flesh, lest he walk naked and see a shame. We are watchful. That's what we are to do in this life. Just one final thought before we close. There's a false prophecy called preterism. There's some very notable teachers that have taught this. A preterist is a person that believes that in the Bible, most, if not all, prophecy is already completed. Therefore, the conclusion from that is that you just look at it, looking in the past, and say, huh, that was interesting. They don't relate it. They don't think it's possible that it's applicable to us today. For example, there's many people that believe the Olivet Discourse was fulfilled in A.D. 70 with the physical destruction of Jerusalem. They forget that it's not one stone upon another. There's still stones upon another in Jerusalem today, and you can see them. The temple stones of the Western Wall are still there. They're still one upon the other. Partial preterists believe in a future last day, but no great tribulation. It's very similar. They, they discount a lot of prophecy in the Bible. The things in the Old Testament were just examples. The things that maybe can give us guidance on life somehow. They don't see the applicability of the, of the Babylonian captivity, how it'll, it'll apply to us. So we see preteritism. It's, it's a lot of people believe that prophecy is not important, and therefore they're really in sense saying that Christ is already here. It's all about your life in the present. Okay, just a quick summary of this study. The Great Tribulation, there's many false Christs and false prophets, and they're there to deceive the wilderness is Christian, the Christian life in this world, and they say that Christ is there, and yet all you have to worry about is the Christian life in this world. And they also say that secret places, your prayer life, and safety in this world is all that's important to you. The churches today have a minimal emphasis on prophecy, and the prophecy that they teach, unfortunately, is pre-tribulational most of the time, and it's usually almost always false. The existential Christian, the one that's just living for today. What can I get out of the church? How can I get some guidance? And maybe I can make some friends or fellowship. It's living for now. It's all about the application, not doctrine and prophecy. Prophecy is the blessed hope. Prophecy informs us about the great tribulation, which is soon to occur in the last day. Please consider subscribing to this channel, and thank you very much for watching this video.